Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Linda. That was a, a brilliant reading, um, and it's, it's a great pleasure to be reading with, with Denise and Linda. Um, and so, sort of having been a part of, of the festival and organising it over the last few years, it's it's, it's a real honour to be to be reading here from from my first collection. And um, so, yeah, I just want to thank the university and the festival and, and Sean for his patient support over the years um, with my poems. Um, I want to begin with a poem, I suppose, celebrating learning. Um, and in the case of this poem, it's the learning that my father did to become a taxi driver in London. The knowledge. Not the knowledge chosen for the national syllabus, nor knowledge scrawled by Mrs. Smith on the board in shaky chalk, but the knowledge I heard my father practice out loud after tea. Not a knowledge of capital cities, of England's football captains, David Beckham's scoring record, nor any pub quiz question, but a knowledge of maps, of London's maps, in more than three dimensions. Maps that covered the dining room, a cheap print of the Hay Wayne, of bubbles and of photographs. Maps he rose each day to enter, a clipboard on his handlebars, to expand his hippocampus. Manor House to Gibson Square, Archway to Gloucester Gate, Penn Street to Portland Place, Consort Road to MOD via Peckham Rye and Westminster Bridge. But I can't buy the wisdom that vocation is hereditary, that sons should give their lives to do the jobs their fathers did. Instead, I learnt not from the front, but from the back seat of his cab, ferrying decision makers, Canary Wharf to Portcullis House, past navvies tunneling the underground through the husk of blackout London to hear and now this argument. Taught to speak by 16 years of answering the register, by milk, chalk and cartridge ink, Shakespeare and the Lord's Prayer, I raise my arm to pay my coins, my tributes to the knowledge. So many of the poems in this book um, are set in, in London, and some of them are set in London's past and present, and sometimes both exist at once, and some drill into layers of history in the city, and others alight on certain moments uh, to do with my history and my family's history. Um, and this poem, I'm going to read now is called Plague Ground, and it, it starts at the Farringdon Cross Row excavation so, site. Plague Ground, 1, 2013. At Farringdon Cross Row, my spade struck, neither leather ball nor ceramic bowl, but a 17th century plague victim's skull. Heavy, its sockets were filled with muck. As I held this skull, I thought of the sod, on fire inside, no anesthetic. I took a photo of bones arranged like sticks in the plots where death laid him, where now I stood. 2, 1665. I stood in the plot where I laid him dead, dead from his groin to his armpit cave, where boils throbbed till he coughed up raves of blood, a corpse cushioning his head. Commissioned to dig the old graves free, I dug the fragments of fibula and femur, the bones of the 14th century, until the soil was shoveled clean. 3, 1348. Back into digging, I shoveled the turf over my shoulder till six feet deep, my spade stuck, struck rock. I pushed the heap of gangrene bodies, smoothed over the earth, hammered a post, no monument, or list of stone-carved names. But a caution, do not cross this land, this hastily undone field, plagued at Farringdon, north of London. There's several poems in the book set in markets. And this poem is in the voice of someone like my grandfather who, who worked in fruit and veg and meat markets in his life after the war. And it begins with an epigraph from Brecht's play, The Resistible Rise of Artur Uri. The cauliflower business in this town is down the drain. This is the market. 
Bundled first editions arrive. Comics released from West End clubs rehearse new material to laborers and foremen. Authority figures stride to cars from young men getting dressed in alleys. A bottle smashes, a cab bleats, laughter swells from opened cafe doors. I used to treat the children on Fridays. Fish wrapped up in the evening standard or trips to Clacton on Saturday mornings. Now I bring home the things I'm given. Boxes of shirts stacked in the hallway, our cupboards stocked with the premium tea. It was found in the street, abandoned. It fell off the back of a lorry, came our way after the death of a long lost Irish cousin. Money is found in the strangest places the wheel arch of a delivery van, wrapped in a bag in a toilet system, under a copper's custodian helmet. Ownership is fluid. Thames. After a day of keeping tugs and waste disposal barges, Sailing races, showboats, and commuter clippers afloat. The Thames turns inwardly to find a space to stretch out in, within a space no bigger than itself, and burrows through the mud and clay where every London intersects to get its nose beneath the grave, then flips the past up like a coin to send afloat its drowned possessions. Anglo-Saxon ordnance, unexploded payloads, bone dice and oyster shells, wedding rings and number plates, and all those you might have been had your time started early. Grave diggers, barrow boys, mole men and cockle pickers, gong farmers and costermongers, resurrectionists and suicides, the taken, the lost, the given. Then settles down to dream again, of all its infant waterways, the estuaries and tributaries that led it here among the rusted holes of years to where there is no space to breathe or settle down to sleep. Um, I'm going to read a different poem now towards the end of the book. Um, and this concerns um, a more kind of personal experience of... Um, becoming a father for the first time four years ago to this almost to the very day um, four years ago my wife and I were at the RVI waiting for the birth of our daughter who's born, who, whose birthday is tomorrow in fact um, and this poem is a kind of meditation really on the, the evening of, of that birth and, and going home and driving back and it was an incredibly hot day driving home from hospital after the hottest day of the year. Something in us yearns for time alone in the night, to think upon our great and lonely stages, where the stories of our lives repeat, but frame our disappearances, these worlds where we are not ourselves, but versions of the ones we left as, vacantly in transit through departure lounges, motorways, and waiting rooms and terminals, places where we watch ourselves move comfortably in sharper suits with smaller, smarter luggage, or indicate from petrol station forecourts in smoother, more successful cars with bodywork like silver muscle, or slumped on a minicab's rain-slavered window, shirking off the future having seen it all by scrolling through the births and deaths and marriages, or told within the tapestry of foam on a pint glass. Your fantasy is waiting in the queue to pass security, a canteen in the welcome break beneath the platform clock, or on the ward where now some magic doctor plies her trade to bring back from the brink your love who's giving birth to love. In such quarters we are held by open time that may go on, though never can. The wheels touch down, 
the junction floats up into view and someone off stage calls your name. Midnight arrives. The ward ejects the recent fathers who walk the drowsy corridors while workers polish floors to mirrors. Past the night's wounded, the roads bruised casualties in the custody of officers. They start again their sleeping cars, their sober undertakings, waiting to be picked up by a different, less impatient man, when home becomes the destination once again. They may shed a tear in passing for their ancient selves, shambling from the closing pubs in pouring rain that also staged a timeout to reflect upon its purpose while the country bathed itself in sun. As something soft and comforting escapes the radio and the whole night begins to be as perfect as an advert that knows that time can be distracted but never ended. They keep their vehicles steady. Now all traffic seems too close and all of time too long to pass alone. Night change. I step across the moon, the small hand of the clock, to lay the bundle of my daughter down, knowing where the flooring waits to exhale. Night remembers other nights. I alight from one life into another, from my long and sobering walk, and creak down to my knees, a father, still a child, bowing to repay his debt. So I'm gonna to return to London uh, briefly now, and, and one of the themes of the book really is is this sense of overlapping lives um, and overlapping time, connected by place. Um, and this poem focuses on um, a job my dad did as an apprentice in the printing press in the 60s. Um, and he was responsible for printing Hansard, which was the notes from uh, parliamentary debates in the House of Commons. And it kind of overlaps a little bit with my time working in London in a misguided career in advertising, which we won't talk about. Hansard. I've been writing elegies for the undead, imag imagining the hovels where their souls will be sent and making sense of their still in use possessions. I'm pressing ears to walls and doors and taking the minutes of the air, my pen on paper, a cardiograph. I'm planning funerals ahead. But nightly, Ghosts arrive with tickets to the picture house to see a film from their time shot in black and white with the pal leads dressed in old style hats and coats. And even though we spoke this morning, I see my teenage father help the right honorable George Brown rise out of the gutter with Dave Darkins and a copper. As I walk past Downing Street, no armed guards or cameras to a black cab on Whitehall, no waiting paparazzi. My father's on a year of half nights, printing Hansard from the Commons. I hear him whisper as I stroll. I sign the Official Secrets Act, smug to know the price hike before the printer's local. And as I write some copy on a client's APRs, I hear myself say to him, Dad, do you ever get creative? Change the words, revise the budget. No, never, not our place. We left the lies to higher men. And as I get this down on paper, I watch him prime the typeset, see him hold his inky hand, much younger than I am now, to pass the baton, no, the torch, no, a cloudy pint. Now here's my mother's father who never touched a drop, lighting up to watch TV. I ask him what's on, but his eyes and mouth are stitched up and I do not have the heart. So I'm just gonna read two more poems. Thank you for, for being such a wonderful audience. Um, Naming the light. We've christened light as light. 
but it has no knowledge of the name. It doesn't notice how it falls between the branches and the blinds, or how it casts a glow on us who rise to meet its wakening in every living form. Don't cheapen it as the reward. It doesn't think itself the doing of the Lord. It has no mind to show the way when everything has burned. When we face the darkness, light will fall out of our language. I know if I'm to name this, this lost for words I feel with you, that I would call the Lord's work if I were a man of faith. The word would never do. And would I want to, when our silence is enough? Thank you. It's been, it's been wonderful, a wonderful festival so far, and I'm very excited about the next few readings we've got um, this evening. Um, so I hope you can stick around for those. Um, but yes, yeah, back with the poet hat on for one last poem. Um, this is the last poem in the book, and in, in the tradition Linda set, I will read, I'll read my last poem. And this moves out towards the edge of America on the West, um, and I suppose it's a poem, um, a, you know, in the kind of reflective mode, looking where else will we go next, I guess. Prayer at the Edge of the West. Now everyone is sleeping with all doors and windows locked and lights switched off, the kids below our room silent, hooked to their devices. I can at last go out into the cold away from the radio's weather reports and baseball scores, to where salt-softened anchors of fur splinter across the beach. To hear night's hollow note resound inside the space I've cleared within myself, where a forest is becoming sea. Slowly, red lights of the boys declare the oasis of the shoreline the far edge of the west, to fishermen still trawling for their unmet quotas. Somewhere between settled night and the wingtip of morning, Pacific time is stopping like a boat that runs on fumes beyond the pool of east and west, where edge becomes center and the center edge and time alone can be itself, and bait and cast a line. Thank you very much, everyone.